So this is part of the women's health ser series that we are trying to prevent present women's health issues uh, in a casual environment. We're going to have two speakers today and they're going to go 20 minutes each and then we'll be able to field questions at the end. So if anybody has questions, feel free to put them into the question section. Um, I just want to give a brief background. We are all osteopathic physicians and we are trained in traditional subjects of medicine, but we also have the special talent of learning osteopathic manipulative medicine. And as a brief overview, it's a treatment that is used by osteopathic physicians to diagnose, treat, and prevent illness or injury. And as do doctors of osteopathic medicine, we receive special training in the musculoskeletal system and this method of treatment, in addition to all of the other subjects that our allopathic or MD counterparts study. So we're very happy today to have two outstanding physicians here who specialize in osteopathic manipulative medicine. And first we're gonna hear from Danielle Cooley and then we'll hear from um, Millicent Chanel and they are both physicians here at Rowan SOM. So um, Dr. Cooley is going to go first. So I'm gonna mute and you can get going. Okay, so I'm still having a minor bit of te technical difficulties here. I still can't share. There's some kind of setting, I guess, on my computer that's not set right since I had to use a different browser. So, Dr. Schnell, can you pull up mine and share mine? Sure, give me one moment. Sorry. Leanne, can you please give me sharing rights? Um, yeah, I just need Dr. Cooley uh, to. I just did. Sorry. I you're just thought I'm so sorry. No, you're okay. <laughs> Dr. Snow, you should be good. Um, let me know if you're not. Uh, All right. Yay. <laughs> there. It's a team effort. All right, just give me a flash uh, or something. Dr. Awesome. Th know. Thank you. Sorry. Uh -huh. So, um, thank everybody for, um, for being here and Dr. Barker for the nice welcome. She kind of gave you a little bit of spoiler alerts into some of what I'm going to talk about today, which is fine. Um, so I really wanted to help define what osteopathic manipulative treatment is and what DOs are. So. Next slide. Um, so, what exactly is a DO? I actually particularly like to ask this question in a big crowd where um, there's lots of you sitting there so that you can give me your variety of answers of things that you think so we can see how much you actually really know or not, but it's a little difficult to do it in this manner. So, um, I'm going to go ahead and tell you. Next slide. So, um, doctors of osteopathic medicine are one of two types of physicians that exist in the world. Um, and there's often a very confusion about what's the difference between a DO or an MD. We get that all the time. And so, um, MDs are, are allopathic physicians and they're trained to be full fledged doctors and DOs are, are osteopathic physicians that are also, uh, trained to be full fledged doctors, but we also have the, um, benefit of learning hands on diagnosis and treatment of different disorders and conditions. So it was so, osteopathic medicine was founded on the philosophy that all the body systems are interrelated and dependent upon one another for good health. Next slide. And this is Dr. Andrew Taylor still. He is actually the founder of osteopathy. He founded it in 1874. He really was the person that pioneered the concept of wellness rather than just disease, but actual wellness. And he recognized the importance of treating illness within the context of the whole body. So instead of focusing on a specific body region or a specific body part, looking not only on that body part, but on the, at the person as a whole. He was um, an MD and a DO, as you can see his name, which is pretty interesting. Um, he was the son of a Methodist minister who was also a doctor and a millwright. And so he had a very strong interest in anatomy and he, at a young age, started like studying animals that he hunted. And um, 
And then yeah. by age 10, he found this very interesting thing. And I have a picture a little bit later on showing exactly what I'm, what I'm just describing, but he found that he used to get headaches. And if he would take a nap on his swing, his headaches would go away. And so he became an MD under his father, cause that's all that existed in the day. And so he was in the apprenticeship model. So instead of going through full training of medical school and residency and the things that our students in at SOM do now, um, he actually was just an apprentice. And after he worked under his dad for a long enough period of time, his dad gave him the blessing that he was good enough to go ahead to go off and be a doctor on his own. And so he would accompany his dad on rounds. He really liked a lot of hunting and trapping animals and he really liked anatomy. And so any type of anatomy textbooks he could find, he would study, he would study the cadavers of Native Americans. Um, because back in those days, um, we didn't have full fledged cemeteries in the, uh, in the mindset that we do now. And so they would take a big hole and dump the bodies in the hole. And so he actually used those bodies to really start studying and, um, learning to know the anatomy. And then interestingly enough, he's had a lot of, he suffered a lot of uh, loss in his life. So his first wife passed away, passed away from a disease and he was left with three young children. And then in 1864, three children, one of which was adopted, all died due to spinal meningitis. And so at this time when he was, you know, studying and learning his, um, his tools and his med medicines that were available to him were things that we know now are not medicines. So arsenic, lead, mercury, things that we know are poisonous is what they were using to treat diseases then. Um, and then he had lost three other children shortly after birth. So in total, he lost six children and a wife, which is just crazy when you start thinking about the numbers. And so you can see that represented on this, um, family tree of his, how he had lost one of his wives and then six, six children. So um, he was really not happy with medicine at the time. And he just kept telling himself, you know, he was such a forethinker. Um, I'm actually rereading his book now with my resident. And as we go through some of the pages, it's amazing to think, to see what he was thinking back in these days before, you know, knowing all the things that we know now, but he was convinced that there's gotta be a better way. So he kept studying to figure out what was the new better way. And so, yes, here's his first lesson in osteopathy. This is what I was describing. So I, I, I usually describe it to people, although nowadays kids don't do this anymore, but those swings and used to have your swing rope swing hanging from a tree branch in your backyard. And that was your idea of a jungle gym. Um, that's what he had. And that's what he would lay like a towel over top and he would lay his head back and he'd fall asleep. And so he kept saying to himself, there's something in the anatomy. There's gotta be something in the nervous system, something is um you know helping helping me and i got to figure out what exactly that is and so he spent 10 years really studying the anatomy and experimenting with things um he really had this idea of structure and function that things are created or developed a certain way because of the function that they hold and so then finally in 1874 he really introduced this concept of osteopathy and then in 1892, he charted the very first school of osteopathy called the American School of Osteopathy in Kirksville, Missouri. And so he was convinced that the musculoskeletal system plays a vital role in health and disease. And, you know, to correct the body structure with manual techniques would help to improve, improve its function and its ability to heal. And so he really wanted to take a look at treating that whole body and that whole person um, concept. And so this was his, um, his first class. And actually the interesting thing is that there's five women. So I thought this was a very appropriate slide to add to our uh, little lecture series today. And it always excites me when I uh, speak to our new faculty at SOM, I do an orientation to the history of osteopathy. And it's always, this is always my favorite slide to show that even back then in the 1800s, there were women involved in medicine. And so what does osteopathic medicine do? Well, we focus on preventative medicine and we really focus on treating the whole person rather than their disease. And so with that treatment, we have a set of tenants that we believe in. So these are the tenants that we go by in osteopathic medicine. It's that the body is a unit and that unit is a, con is a comprised of mind, body, and spirit. So it's, it's really not just the fact that someone's body part hurts, 
but it also has to do with their mental thinking about their body part and their disease process, as well as their, their spiritual beliefs. Um, and so this, you know, comes into play a lot in our practice when we're seeing patients for the first time is really trying to understand where they are in the mind part. Like, what are they thinking exactly? And, you know, are they, are they seeking us as like a last hope and like, they've kind of already given up or are they, you know, convinced that they want to do something to make changes and get themselves better. And, and knowing that is what helps us to help determine the treatment that we provide to all of them. Um, our second tenant is that the, that structure and function are reciprocally related, meaning because things are, you know, and if you think about this in just any aspect of life, right? We design different things, tables, chairs, doors, cars to function for a certain way. And so that's how they get their structure is to help their function and the body is exactly the same way. And then the body has the ability to heal and self-regulate and self-monitor. And so we, we see that, right? When we um, get a little cut on our hand, um, you know, if it doesn't need stitches and it's not extremely deep, right? That cut eventually will heal and go away. And that's the body's ability to really heal itself and to like help regulate itself to get it better. Um, the body will send blood vessels and all of our inflammatory responses to that cut to help that cut get better. And then really our rational treatment um, of, the, of the patient is based on all three of these tenants put together. And so um, during our training as DOs, we received that extra education in anatomy and musculoskeletal and how the musculoskeletal imbalances affect our body. And we really are taught and we currently teach the students how to use their hands to help diagnose you know, problems of the musculoskeletal system, but also problems throughout the rest of the organ systems of the body based on you know where patients are having pain and things that we're palpating on physical exam. And so we as osteopathic physicians use all of the tools at modern medicine. Um, we can prescribe medications. That's always when I ask what do what are DOs, what's the difference? They tell me people you, DOs can't prescribe medication or they can't be surgeons. So those are actually untrue. Um, we can prescribe medications, we can do surgeries, our students you know, go into many different fields, anesthesia, neurosurgery, radiology, interventional radiology, um, but they have in their training a strong focus on primary care. And so we as an institute pride ourselves on producing primary care physicians. Um, and then they incorporate their osteopathic manipulative medicine, you know, regimen and treatment into the care of the patient. And so many, um, many of our colleagues that are not directly in our department and many of our students, they, may not practice the actual hands-on techniques that we're going to you know show you later but they still take the concepts and the philosophy that they've been taught throughout this whole time and use that um and even you know sometimes they may not feel comfortable doing all of them themselves but a lot of my colleagues particularly in family medicine they immediately know when someone could benefit from omm and they get them over to see myself or one of, or one of my other uh, osteopathic colleagues and so, you know, osteopathic physicians are held to the same standards as allopathic physicians or MDs. We have, they have to take boards, um, they have to be licensed, we have to take recertifications of boards and things like that. So they're, in that respect, we're exactly the same. And so when a patient is visiting a DO for their healthcare, we try to make it more of a partnership with the patient. Um, years back, it was more of a, a mother father relationship to the patient where the doctor tells you what to do and you do what they tell you. Um, but we try to really change that and focus on the patient and really give them, um, you know, an equal play in their healthcare. Um, you know, I, I rarely tell a patient, here's what you have to do. Like I usually say, here's what our options are, this, this, and this, what, what do you want to do? And that kind of gets their spiritual and their, their uh, mind involved in it because then they're going to, really get involved and pick the outlet that they think that they can do best. And so, um, sorry, thank you. And so we approach healthcare really just, you know, looking at more aspects in the patient um, and really like taking into account what their goals are, what, they, what they're, you know, and meet them where they are to help them kind of improve their care. And so we really train the, the students to look at a DO as the whole person. So if a patient's coming in to us complaining about, you know, elbow pain or shoulder pain, the first thing that we do is really do a 
physical assessment of the patient, not go for the shoulder, but start looking at other parts of the body. Start looking at their upper back. Start looking at their neck. Start looking at the things that lead into their shoulder. Start looking at their elbow. You know, asking them a lot of questions about their personal life, like what do you do for fun? What do you do, you know, as your occupation? Things like that that will have an influence on maybe what's happening with them. Um, what's happening in your life? How are things, right? Sometimes that can really lead you into exactly where you need to go and finding out exactly what you need to find out without even starting to examine them yet. And then, you know, we look at each person as more than just a collection of the individual body systems and organs, but as one whole approach. And so we take that really holistic approach to the care of the patient. And so you'll hear these words probably used interchangeably or these letters, right? Um, I know osteopathic manipulative medicine is a mouthful and often hard for people to say. So for short, we like to call it OMM. Um, we also will call it OMT, meaning osteopathic manipulative treatment. And so all of those things can really be used interchangeably. But what it is, is really a set of these hands on techniques that we use to diagnose illness and injury, relieve pain, restore range of motion, and then enhance the body's ability to heal because we want the body to stay in motion. And lack of motion in any particular body part or region is going to lead to disease development. So our goal is to really keep everything moving appropriately. And so the different techniques that we, you know, have are many different. They're they're quite a variety of things. We have something called myofascial release, which is like a gentle force on the fascial tissues. And um, people may you may be saying, what is fascia? Like, what is that? If you haven't done any anatomy, I get it. Um, so my best akin to to help people understand is like when you're cutting raw chicken and there's that layer of skin over top that you're trying to peel away often that's fascia and so that's what we're talking about is this bundle of tissue that surrounds the musculature um, we also do things called strain counter strain so we look at muscles that kind of work um, opposite each other and one causes a strain and so we're trying to shorten that muscle to get that muscle to relieve itself it's often um, <clears throat> a very gentle technique as well and then we do some other things that really make the patient get involved. So some things like muscle energy where patients actually have to sit in a certain position and then we require the patient to actually provide a force against what we're doing to help um, get that muscle to then relax itself and we can stretch it further. And then we do other things, you know, like soft tissue, which is again, what most people usually referred to as massage, although we don't like to use that word massage. And then we know we're not giving you a massage, we're treating you. Um, and then cranial is looking at the um, bones of the skull and doing techniques to, uh, to help the bones of the skull. And then we also do a lot of stuff with lymphatic, the lymphatic system. So helping your drainage system of your body to get the bad things out. And then we do some other techniques. Um, this one's my favorite because the patients, when the students say, what are you doing? And I say BLT and this pa patient looks up and they're like bacon, lettuce, tomato. No, actually it's balanced ligamentous tension. And so it's actually taking the muscles or the joints and putting them into their position of ease and allowing the tension to be taken off of them to allow them to relax. And then the last thing we do, some people really like and some people really don't like, um, but it does make some noises. So some people don't like any popping noises or things that happen. So there are certain patients that we use these techniques for and others that we don't, but it's called high velocity, low amplitude. So with all that said, the next question I always get is, is OMT the same thing as chiropractic treatment? And obviously the answer is no, right? <laughs> um, and so, What's the difference? Well, chiropractors have really limit, limited medical training. They can um, order imaging studies, but they can't prescribe medicines. They can't go into all the different fields of medicine, as I, um, as I mentioned, versus the osteopathic physician who really has attended medical school, is a fully licensed medical doctor in all states. Um, chiropractors use a lot of those cracking or those popping techniques that um, I was just discussing versus we as osteopaths are trained to use a lot of different modalities and never the same set of treatments on every single person because everyone is different. And so, you know, we look at we look at all those attachments. We look at that whole body person instead of just trying to fix the spinal level that needs to get moved back into place. We're thinking about the musculature that's attached to that spinal level and how we treat the musculature before we then go and realign the spine. And then they believe like the nervous system is the basis of all health. So if you treat the nerves, you treat everything else versus we believe that 
we're restoring motion in all of the body and having balance among all systems in the body to keep the body uh, in motion. Oh, I forgot to fix this. <laughs> and currently, there are very many. <laughs> Dr. Chanel has the actual number because she told me that this was wrong, and I totally forgot to fix it. Um, 102,000. 102,000 uh, practicing uh, physicians in the US. Um, many are serving in primary care fields like family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, and obstetrics and gynecology. Um, but there's, you know, more than 20% of the medical students in the US are trained to be osteopathic physicians. Um, you know, there's more than 4,200 new osteopathic physicians entering the workforce this year. And I have to tell you, our DO schools are like the fastest growing thing in medicine these days. Every day, I feel like I'm hearing about a new school that's potentially opening up here or there, which is amazing because we want more and more DOs out there. And so, you know, we, again, we want that hands-on care. You know, the medical science is unveiling new discoveries, new scanning, new medications, new treatments, all of those things. So, you know, it's easy to forget that sometimes what patients really just need is, you know, a healing touch. I'm sure many of you could think about times you've gone to the doctor or the doctors kind of stood at the doorway and told you what was going on or barely laid their hands on you or came and examined you for two seconds and then left. But we, um, you know, try to remember to train our osteopathic physicians that, you know, we, we never forget this. We always want to include hands-on care and hands-on treatment. And with that, thank you, Dr. Chanel, for being such a great slide host. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Chanel. Thank you, Dr. Cooley. Uh, at any time, let me just see how I can get my uh, slide shows up uh, so I can share the right thing. That's not the right thing. So close. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure where my slide went. A moment. All right. So I'm going to be presenting a case uh, talking about osteopathic considerations and manipulative treatment for a headache. So I'll mention again the tenets of osteopathy, with Dr. Cooley already mentioned. I'll also talk about the different treatment models because there are different approaches or philosophies of uh, approach and most osteopathic physicians who incorporate OMM into their practice use several modalities and several treatment models, which is different than the te techniques themselves. It's what you're focused on and what your attention is being given to. Then we'll review some anatomy and talk about how they can, can, can contribute to headache and talk about how to do a focused structural exam uh, when we're evaluating headache. And Dr. Cooley and I are both board certified in osteopathic manipulative treatment in addition to being board certified in family practice. Um, and so when you are seeing a DO who is not board certified, they might do a much more focused treatment uh, and, and really narrow it down. If you come to see us in one of our practices, we tend to treat almost always head to toe or something close to it for most of the things that come in. It's just the nature of how our specialty practice is set up. Um, but we'll talk about how to do a more focused structural exam and treatment, and then give an example of some treatments that we might do for headache. So again, these are the tenets of osteopathy. There are four of them that Dr. Cooley already mentioned, that the person is a unit of mind, body, and spirit. The body is capable of self-regulation, self-healing, and health maintenance. And structure and function are reciprocally interrelated, and we base our treatment on these first three tenets. And that's really important. It's why we focus so much on anatomy to say, is the skeletal system lined up correctly? Is there normal tension in the muscles, normal tension and movement of the fascia? Do the joints move the way they're supposed to move? And that can be anywhere from the head all the way down to your feet. Um, and do you have proper mobility of even the organ systems uh, in, within your thoracic and abdominal cavity. 
And then all those are going to contribute to how we evaluate you and what we palpate for. So there are five models of osteopathic treatment, biomechanic, respiratory, circulatory, neurologic, metabolic, energetic, and behavioral. And again, at any given time, a physician might be using multiple modalities or treatment models when they're approaching a patient. So what do we mean by each of these? When we talk about neurologic, we're really talking about the central and peripheral nervous system. A lot of times when we're incorporating this particular model, we're focused on the autonomic nervous system. So if you guys remember fight or flight from uh, your high school or college days of science and your autonomic nervous system, we're looking at where do the sympathetic and parasympathetic innervations come from that might contribute to that. We can also look at the metabolic and energetic model. So do we have proper motion and movement uh, and function of our endocrine organs, so our adrenal glands, our thyroid glands, et cetera. Uh, is there appropriate uh, uh, restrictions or movement on the soft tissue surrounding those organ systems, including our GI system, so specifically for our constipation and colic in young children or irritable bowel uh, uh, syndrome or inflammatory bowel disease. We look at that in the GI system. Uh, for behavioral models, we have a psychological uh, and uh, social activities associated with that to look at the mind and habits of a, of a patient uh, as we're treating them. So in our biomechanical model, that's much more straightforward and most people understand that most directly. We're looking at your musculoskeletal system. So when we look at the muscles in your body, are they moving properly? Do they have the full range of motion? Do they have the appropriate strength? The fascia that Dr. Cooley referenced, so when you pull that chicken apart and you pull that skin off of the meat of the chicken, you see that clear sort of saran wrap looking tissue, that's fascia. And we have it throughout our body, not just around our musculoskeletal system and our muscles, but also around all of our organs. It's part of what helps us suspend our organs within our, our chest and abdominal cavities. Uh, and looking at proper alignment of our bones, whether it be our vertebra or our hips or the bones within our hands or feet, we're looking for appropriate alignment. And lastly, uh, but not least, the respiratory circulatory model. So when we say circulation, we can be talking about uh, blood, so arterial or venous. We can also be talking about uh, the lymphatic system, as Dr. Cooley mentioned, which clears out all the waste products. So when you are sick or bacteria or waste products or function, uh, our lymphatic system is what helps clear that out. So is it properly flowing? And our respiration. So when we breathe and exchange oxygen uh, for CO2, that helps create energy within our body. So are we breathing properly? Do we have proper motion of our rib cage? And that diaphragm is a big muscle that helps our lymphatic system. So are all of those things moving properly? And those are all the things that we're looking at. For the purpose of this uh, case, we're gonna be focusing on three of those models. So looking at the biomechanical, the respiratory, circulatory, and the neurologic model. Uh, but certainly there's a little bit of behavioral sprinkled in there. Uh, and you're really always using a little bit of all of them. So when we talk about headache, the International Headache Society classifies them as primary or secondary. And things like migraine or autonomic headaches are considered primary. Things that are considered secondary are something happened or there's another disease process and headache is a secondary component of that. So obviously trauma is an obvious one. Uh, people can have post-concussive headaches, um, but you can also have things like infections, like sinus infections uh, or ear infections. You can also have tension uh, coming that's contributing from other parts. If you have an injury to your shoulder or to your back that can cause uh, tension and cause headaches as well. Mood disorders and psychiatric disorders, uh, the most common of which that we see are, are anxiety and depression. The way people carry tension in their bodies, clenching their teeth, shrugging and tightening their shoulders, uh, the irritation that that caused to their GI system, all of that can contribute uh, and lead to headaches. Uh, as well as other painful lesions associated with the cranial nerves and facial pain. So let's talk about a case. So we have a 32 year old female who comes to the office complaining of headaches at the front of her head and the back of her head over the last month. Uh, she says that she has a history of headaches that come and go that started when she was a teenager and often related to stress. The patient wife works long hours and is often alone, just often alone managing childcare of their children. Her past medical history uh, is uh, significant for high cholesterol and these headaches. She denies any surgeries. Uh, her mother and father are alive uh, and have no medical problems. She has no allergies and the only medication she's on is Zocor for her high cholesterol and she takes over-the-counter Excedrin for her headaches. 
When we talk about any other symptoms that she's having, she doesn't have any fevers or chills. She has the headache she describes, but no visual changes, no hearing changes, no sore throat or nasal congestion. She has no chest pain or shortness of breath, no problems with coughing or wheezing. So we're really moving away from thinking this is something uh, more secondary. She has no nausea or vomiting, no diarrhea, no constipation, and she has no radiation to her arms or other parts of her body and no weakness. Our physical exam is, is pretty normal. She has normal blood pressure and normal heart rate. She's 5'4 and 155 pounds, so she's a little overweight. Um, but on the exam, she's essentially normal, except when we get to her musculoskeletal exam. And when we do that, we see she has tightness along the muscles uh, along her spine um, and otherwise, but she has normal strength and normal reflexes. So let's talk about how we as osteopathic physicians look at the body a little bit differently. Um, I once had a, a colleague of mine uh, who was an MD uh, tell me that her training was very different uh, as an allopathic physician. She said, we really focused on the central nervous system and the, and the, and the organs, the viscera. And we sort of treat, these are her words, we treat the musculoskeletal system sort of like an out of box for an iPhone. Like it's just there to protect the organs and the central nervous system. Um, and you're really not interested in the musculoskeletal system unless you're cutting through it, unless you're a surgeon, uh, or you're going into something like sports medicine. Uh, for the purposes of how we describe sections of the body, we, dis we divide the body up into 10 body regions. So your head, your cervical, your neck region, your thoracic, which is your upper back and middle back region, your lumbar spine, which is your low back, your sacrum, which is your tailbone, your pelvis, which are your hips, and of course your arms and legs, your rib cage, and your abdomen. And as I mentioned before, we're going to focus on three models of treatment. So we're going to look at the biomechanics, the nervous system, and circulation. I put it this way, biomechanics, autonomics, and circulation, because we got your back. So BAC. Structurally, when we look at the head, uh, you may not be aware of it, but you have, it's not just one big carved out bone with your brain shoved inside. It's actually made up of several bones uh, that come together. And we're just talking at the moment about the bones of the skull. So we're not talking about facial bones and we're not talking about the jaw or the mandible per se. Uh, but in the cranium itself, you have the frontal bone, which is one bone, the parietal bone in blue, which are two bones, so there's one on each side, the temporal bone, uh, which is orange and there's one on each side, the sphenoid bone, which actually runs straight through the head, so there's actually only one of those, and the occipital bone, which is the back of your head. The two things I want to point out here are your TMJ, which stands for temporomandibular joint. So where the temporal bone and the mandible or the jaw come together. Uh, and this line, everywhere you see a line between the colored sections is a suture. It's a joint, essentially. So uh, the sutures of the head have a certain amount of motion, not a ton, thank goodness, but they do have motion. And when those are restricted, it can cause headache and cause other dysfunctions. One of those sutures that we spend a lot of time paying attention to is the occipital mastoid suture. So this part of the temporal bone is called the mastoid process. And this suture line between the orange and the green is an area of a, a lot of importance. We also look at the coronal suture between the frontal bone and the parietal bones, another place that has a lot of restriction. And the nasal bone uh, with the frontal bone is another place where people have a lot of tension. And so you can see that makes up the upper portion just over your eye. So those are all areas that we tend to look at structurally just within the head itself. From a circulatory standpoint, uh, you have all of the lymphatics uh, in the head. So you have your lymph nodes, which are in front of your and behind your ears, under your chin. And if we were to leave the head, we go down into the neck, they're actually throughout your body. And the air sinuses. So everybody knows and thinks about sinus infections. So you have the frontal sinuses, the ethmoid sinuses, and the maxillary sinuses there. Uh, they're supposed to be there for air, but they can uh, fill up with fluid and infection, and that can cause pain as well. Uh, and those are all areas that we can look for changes over the skin. So when people have infections or have fluid uh, in what should be air sinuses, they tend to get uh, some soft tissue changes. So a little bit of bogginess or swelling uh, to touch. It's not usually obvious visually, but when you palpate or feel over that area, you can feel those changes over the skin. And it's usually tender to touch. So the patient will say it's sore if you touch that area. And so those are all areas that we can treat. 
taking a deeper look at that temporal mandibular joint, there's a lot of musculature that happens that comes off of your head and goes down into your jaw. And so those are all areas where you can get tightness. It affects how not only how your jaw moves, but because of its connection from the jaw into the temporal bones can lead to headaches. Uh, and so it's one of the areas that we look at. This is a view looking from behind the patient. So if you look in this upper right hand corner, you'll see what the slices of the head. So we're looking from behind and looking forward. You see the patient's chin and we see their teeth. And we're looking here at what would be the nose. And this is actually where your pituitary gland would sit inside the sphenoid bone. But I, this is one of my favorite pictures. I just think it's just so fantastic. Um, we see the pterygoid muscles, which help open and close your jaw. But those muscles can get tight too, just like when people clench their jaw out of tension or restraint or diplomacy, whatever you want to call it. Uh, they can get tension here and that can put strains on the jaw and up into the head. And so those are areas that we can treat. We put gloves on and we can treat the inside of those muscles as well as uh, treating the muscles on the outside that affect the jaw. Other big muscle groups. So trapezius muscle goes from the base of the head all the way down the cervical spine, the thoracic spine, and out to the shoulder. This picture doesn't show it, but it wraps around to the front of your collarbone. It's what helps you shrug your shoulders or bring your shoulders back or tilt your head back. The SDM or sternocleidomastoid is what helps you turn your head from side to side or tilt your head forward if they're both contracting. But you can see that muscle goes all the way from the collarbone up into the back of your head up into that uh, mastoid process on that temporal bone again. So muscles coming up from your neck and your chest can go up into your head and cause headache as well. Deeper to those muscles, uh, we have a uh, levator scapula here. That's a muscle that goes from your shoulder blade up into your neck, just right underneath the base of your head. And your rhomboid muscles, which go again from your shoulder blade out to the base of your neck and into the upper back. Again, those help to bring your shoulders back, but if you have tension there for any number of reasons, you have a bad table height at your desk and you're sitting a lot, or because you're tense or overusing, if you're lifting a lot and you're lifting poorly, all that can lead to headaches. And if we go even deeper, we can see some of the really small muscles that give sort of the bobblehead motion that you're able to do to say yes or no or anything that you're doing. Um, but those are deeper muscles that can also have tension, the suboccipital muscles. This is the occiput. This is the occiput. And we see those tiny but really important muscles that can cause tension into the base of the head and to the upper neck. And along the back from the head all the way down to the tailbone, we have smaller but really intricate muscles, the rotatory brevis and longus and multifidus muscles that only traverse one or two joint spaces between the individual vertebra, but run all the way up from the tailbone up into uh, the base of the head. And all of those can get tight and cause restrictions and contribute to pain and dysfunction. Something else that can exist uh, in the musculature is something called trigger points, which is tightness in one area of musculature or tissue can refer pain somewhere else. So everywhere you see X is where you might have tension and where you see sort of the red blotches where that tension can refer pain. And so whether we treat with our hands or do injections, we can treat these trigger points to uh, help treat the other referred pain that exists. So when we see the trapezius muscles going up into the neck, into the base of the head, wrapping all the way forward into the front of the head, a lot of people complain of headaches that start at the base of the head and wrap forward or wrap around to the front. And that has to do with the concept of trigger points and referred pain. So when we address those muscles, we can help resolve those areas of pain. Talking about the nervous system, that fight or flight, parasympathetic and sympathetic, we look at the vagus nerve as a big nerve that affects uh, parasympathetic innervation to most of the body. And there are other parasympathetic innervations within the head, but we're going to focus on vagus. And that specifically when it comes to the head can affect uh, increased secretions from the nose, from the eyes, from the glands and the, and the jaw. Uh, and so again, if you're talking about headache, if there is uh, an uh, autonomic component to that, whether the person has infection or the person is having allergies, we want to be able to balance the parasympathetic innervation. And so we look at the base of the head, the vagus nerves comes out of that uh, foramen and that suture we talked about before, the occipital mastoid suture. Uh, and so we look for restrictions there to help treat 
There's also vagus, vagal components at the upper cervical region, so we treat the upper cervical regions to affect those too. Looking for alignment and making sure that there's no tightness or tenderness in those areas that can be treated to resolve those dysfunctions and help increase functionality. When we talk about the opposite end of the spectrum, the sympathetics, we look at the upper back at the levels of thoracic levels one through four. And again, we're looking for things that are rotated out of place. We're looking for tightness in the muscles. Uh, and we're looking for tenderness that might be treated. When we have excessive uh, sympathetic tone, we get tightness of the arteries uh, and vessels that go and supply blood. We also see a, a slight uh, increase of uh, some of the glands as well and increased flow to the skeletal system. So I talked before about how you can have 10 body regions that we evaluate, but just for the purposes of this case, we'll focus on her head, her neck, her upper thoracics, uh, and her upper extremities, specifically her trapezius. On exam, we find that she has some temporal mandibular joint dysfunction or TMJ dysfunction, because when she opens her jaw, it shifts to the left instead of going straight down. She has a restriction of that suture we were talking about at the base of her head that can affect the vagal, vagus nerve as well as cause tension uh, just from the tightness itself. The way her head, the occiput sits on her atlas, that's her OA joint, uh, is tight and not moving fully. Uh, and she has tightness of her levator scapula that goes from her neck down to her shoulder blades on both sides. She also has some rotation in her upper thoracic and mid thoracic region. Uh, and she has tightness of her trapezius muscles with trigger points to her frontal area, meaning the tightness in that upper muscle across her shoulders goes up into the front of her head. So when you press on it, it causes pain somewhere else. So our goals of treatment are to resolve the somatic dysfunction anywhere there's tightness, where there shouldn't be tightness, anywhere there's malalignment of the skeletal system, we wanna get it lined up properly. And we wanna restore balance to the autonomic nervous system. So specifically to that thoracic region and to her, uh, the base of her occiput. And we also wanna help her diaphragm uh, move better. And there are different, what we call diaphragms throughout the body, one of which is throughout the upper chest where lymphatic drainage takes place into the thoracic duct. Uh, and we wanna increase lymphatic flow throughout, but especially from her head and neck. And we'll help her identify and come up with strategies to mitigate some of her stress. So again, I won't go through this again, but we're looking at all the autonomic innervations that can contribute to her pain, the musculoskeletal components that can contribute to her pain, uh, as well as looking at circulation that can affect lymphatics. And so we'll look at some treatments that we can do using our hands to affect the areas that we have uh, found restrictions and dysfunctions in. So here's a demonstration, just a, a screenshot of a technique where the physician has their fingers at the base of the head on the, under that occiput to help relieve tension. And they're pulling tension towards the physician to help relieve those small occipital muscles that we were talking about before. It's hard to see from this picture, but you can have your fingers on that suture that we talked about to help relieve uh, restrictions. And the patient's completely relaxed and not doing anything while the physician is doing the technique. We can also do soft tissue techniques, which is treating the muscles that run along the neck. You can do a longitudinal stretch, which is going from the base of the neck to the top of the head, or you can stand at the side and do what's called a perpendicular stretch, which is coming out laterally and pulling on the muscles to stretch those muscles so that they can relieve tension. Dr. Cooley mentioned thoracic muscle energy. Uh, and in this one, we're finding that the patient has a rotation in the thoracic uh, spine. And so the physician is taking them uh, and stretching them out and having them push against the physician's hands to help stretch those muscles to get a better range of motion of those muscles and help return those vertebra to the appropriate position. And lastly, I think this is the last one I have is the trapezius inhibition, which is pressing on these muscles in the upper trapezius to help break the tension that's there, which will not only help give better range of motion to the shoulder, the neck, and the base of the head because of where the trapezius is attached, but it'll stop those trigger points that radiate up into the frontal region that the patient is complaining of headaches at. Oh, there's one more. And thoracic inlet, talking about lymphatic techniques. Uh, and so all of the lymphatics from the head and neck drain down through this area where your clavicle and the musculature, like your scalenes, your stenopodomastoid are, 
we want to evaluate and look for restrictions there. You can do this with the patient seated or lying down, but helping to make sure you have full motion in this area so that you can have proper drainage of the lymphatic system. So our assessment and plan, we said she has tension headaches exacerbated by stress. We treated her with manipulation as described previously. We gave her some home exercises directed at some of those muscles that we talked about. And then we talked about stress management with the patient and, and what other things that she could do to help alleviate uh, the stress that comes with taking care of children alone a lot. And that might, in this case, talk about what other help she can get. Can she get a mother's helper? Can she get some friends to help? Uh, can she look for uh, shared babysitting or other things that can help her with that? Because that's really the source of a lot of her stress and her increased headaches. And so as osteopathic physicians, we wanna get to the root of the cause. So yes, she has headaches, but we know that the headache is coming from stress and we know that the stress is coming from <laughs> taking care of children alone. So how can we evaluate and look at help, helping her navigate what are her options? When patients are in pain or they're in their stress, they're not always thinking as clearly as they could. So we become coaches in that way to help them navigate that and look at how we can problem solve to the root of the issue that the patient is dealing with. So again, our goal as osteopathic physician is really addressing mind, body, and spirit and recognize in this case, the large number of muscular and bony contributions to headache and talking about how we can retrain our anatomy and our mindset uh, which starts in the office with a physician, but then we extend home to a treatment plan with home exercises and how we're going to change how we live our daily lives to improve our health. So with that, I've slung in there our contact information. We have two sets of offices with OMM doctors, one in the Stratford office and one in Sewell. Uh, myself and Dr. Cooley and Dr. Avin at the Stratford office and Dr. Bailey and Dr. King are at the Sewell office. And thank you very much. And here are my references. So with that, I will stop sharing. And uh, I'm not sure if we have any questions, uh, Linda or Leanne. Um, well, anybody can feel free. If you have questions, you can type it into the question section. Um, I have a few questions and I'm going to start with Dr. Cooley. Um, my first question is, who can benefit from OMM? Is this limited to age or sex or gender or anything? that would help us know. Yeah, so the great thing is that it's for everyone of all ages, sizes, and anything. So um, we do treat pregnant patients while they're pregnant to help kind of get their body ready for delivery. We treat babies right after birth to help with the cranial bones that Dr. Chanel referenced, um, particularly if babies are having trouble sucking or latching on if they're trying to breastfeed. And then uh, lots of times we get uh, lots of older patients. Patients don't wanna have surgery. They wanna just be able to go for a walk in the neighborhood with their grandkids. And so we treat them too. And you know, young kids with sports, I mean, there's just quite a variety of things that we can, can do. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Chanel, what type of disorders or diagnoses do you typically treat with OMM? Everything. Uh, no, I mean, I'm in a specialty organization. I, I did family practice for about 10 years. So in my family practice office, I saw a lot of headaches. So I did a lot of uh, treatments with my patients who came acutely in acutely uh, with respiratory. So you know, colds and respiratory illnesses and sinus infections. Um, and certainly for my chronic asthmatics, uh, we look at them as well to see what could be contributing to make sure their rib cage was moving well and they had good lymphatic systems. In uh, the specialty practice that focuses more on musculoskeletal issues, uh, it's not too much differently. I don't treat as many acute illnesses. Uh, I treat more chronic illnesses, but we treat pregnant patients. We treat babies with plagiocephaly, which is sort of the misshapen head when babies sort of come out and their heads are a little flatter, a little more misshapen than uh, we might we might want. Um, I do have a lot of headache patients, uh, several patients with inflammatory bowel disease and irritable bowel and GI uh, disorders. And then of course your neck pains, your shoulder pains, your back pains, your knee pains, your hip pains, all the pains uh, that people come in and, and, and feel plagued with uh, more, usually more chronically. We do have some uh, acute pains that come through uh, that we treat as well. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Cooley, is there a place for OMM in the treatment of COVID-19? Oh no, oh, sorry. I was having trouble unmuting for a second there. Um, so yeah, so it's a respiratory illness. So there are sets of different lymphatic treatments. In fact, one of our colleagues, not here, but across the country, because all of us DOs tend to know each other pretty well that do a lot of the hands-on manipulation. 
put together, actually, she put together a video of how patients can actually treat themselves and do some lymphatic techniques to themselves. Um, the other thing is that the lymphatic system, as Dr. Schnell was describing, and some of the treatments is really helpful after you get vaccinated to help your, you know, push those antibodies and move them around and get get things moving. So uh, we can also do some lymphatic treatments post, you know, any type of um, vaccine. Thanks. Um, and Dr. Chanel, can somebody with limb length discrepancy be prone to headaches? Sure, uh, limb length discrepancies can cause a lot of uh, areas of pain, uh, especially in the low back and hips. And for reasons that, for things that go on beyond the scope of this talk, when you affect your tailbone, you can really uh, exacerbate uh, headaches. And so treating the, the leg length discrepancy can be very helpful, whether we're treating it with our hands, if it's just a malrotation, or treating it with heel lifts, if there's an actual anatomical short leg, uh, that can help level patients out and take off an appropriate tension. And the last question I have is um, osteopathic manipulative medicine treatments are covered by insurance. Yes, thank goodness. Um, yes, uh, Medicare actually has great coverage of osteopathic treatments and oftentimes we get patients coming in saying, well, I don't know how many more treatments I can do. And I'm like, you have Medicare? And they're like, yeah, I'm like, you can have unlimited treatments. It's unlike physical therapy and it's unlike chiropractic um, where we're using different sets of codes that bill for, so there really isn't a limitation. Some insurance companies do kind of treat it as um, a separate procedure, so they, it may be more of a copay sometimes when you come in for manipulation, you're paying not just your regular copay, but an extra copay. Um, but yes, it is covered by almost every insurance. Great, let me see, I think there might be one more. Um, okay, last question. Um, there's so many older people that end up with the need to get a joint replacement, hip or knee. Can OMM help avoid or delay the need for a total joint replacement? So I don't, we do not take away osteoarthritis if someone has osteoarthritis, but a lot of times the pain that people associate with those things, you know, are not necessarily coming from the osteoarthritis. So to the degree that you can have dysfunctions, particularly hamstrings, adductors, piriformis, gluteal muscles that can contribute to pain and people might assume that it's because they have arthritis, we can certainly address and treat those. So just like people with herniated discs, a certain percentage of the population that is walking around with herniated discs that's not causing them any pain. Uh, and plenty of people that have uh, that have pain that don't have herniated discs, there are plenty of people who are walking around without osteoarthritis or with osteoarthritis and that's not necessarily the source of their pain. Uh, and so we can absolutely treat those things. And we've certainly treated plenty of people with knee and, and hip pain um, because pain is really what drives most people to get those replacements is that they can't function anymore. Most people are not bone on bone uh, where you're talking about mechanical reasons uh, to change them from that perspective. And so, yes, we treat a lot of people with, with hip and knee pain uh, and hopefully stave off uh, their, their gate dysfunctions and, and keep them out of the operating room longer. Great. Well, I want to thank Dr. Cooley and Dr. Chanel for just wonderful presentations, very informative. Um, and I would hope that everybody would uh, either send any other questions they might have and please try and join us. We're going to continue this series. It will be the second Wednesday of every month and we have a lineup of speakers uh, through the end of the year. So again, thanks so much for your participation. I, I learned a lot. I think everybody here learned a lot um, and hopefully we can utilize these therapies much more frequently. Um, thank you, Dr. Brecker. Yes, thank you, Dr. Brecker. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.